you know, one of my initial marketing tactics was when you're at a festival, you're so inundated with like, you know, food and music and people that the only two places that you're going to pay attention is the parking structure. When you're parking your car, there's not a lot to look at. And then the, the urinals and the, the bathrooms, right? So I would plaster my posters in those areas. And after the first day, I was selling so much product. They were like, hey, I know that yesterday we said no, but we want to now buy your merchandise and put it in our merchandise area. You got to pick yourself up, go backwards and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Rebecca Minkoff, fashion designer and founder of the Female Founder Collective, Diana Kaff, author of Girls Who Run the World, Andrew Dudham, founder of Hymns, and Eugene Rem, co-founder of Rumble Fitness, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara from Unstoppable, and we're so excited to have Daniel Cassidi, founder and CEO of Rastaclat. Nice to, did I pronounce the name right? You got it perfectly, Ross the Clock. Yay! Okay, <laughs> I've been practicing all morning, so excited. So uh, first generation American born in Kenya, Daniel, I'm so proud of you, like just doing it, right? You're just going out and figuring out how do I go launch this business? We met through our mutual friend, Mark at Iconic, super, super cool. And uh, he's the founder and CEO of Rastaclat, which I mentioned. And basically, for those of you who don't know about it, super, super, way cool, made to order handcrafted shoelace bracelets that are just absolutely awesome and gorgeous. So this entrepreneur has an incredible, inspiring you know, community to create change around him, which I want to hear more about. And... You know, I just think also just a lot of what I see in you and your messaging is you're just really positive, which is like what people need during this time. And it's super, super great. So, but you're based in LA, correct? Yeah, actually, Ross Cloud is based in Long Beach, California, founded in Long Beach, California. So we've been there um, you know, quite a while now. So That's awesome. So welcome, 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 Thank welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you went from bootstrapping to scaling this multi-million dollar business. Like, yeah. talk to me about it. It sounds, it just comes out so easy, but the process was, it's, it's been a... It's right? A just snap your fingers and it happened. Yeah. You know, the process for me and really the, the journey and the story kind of starts, you know, for me being a young kid and, you know, just having a lot of passion for fashion and, you know, sports and skateboarding and things of that nature. And sort of the culmination of like those passions when I was 17 years old, I was trying to become a professional skateboarder. Um, and being in California, you know, that's like, that's a thing that people do. And I just loved it. And I fell in love with it. And I started getting a uh, shoe sponsors. So uh, shoe companies would notice me and you're kind of like a micro influencer. And they'd send you these, you know, pairs of shoes to skateboard. And I was always just really creative. And, you know, one day I decided to make an extra just to make a bracelet out of my extra pair of shoelaces that was in the box. And little would I know, I'd go to school the next day and, you know, my friends would ask for this kind of handmade bracelet, you know, and I obliged. And sort of the magic in it was when I gave it to them, there was a sense of, you know, confidence. Like someone told me like, hey, somebody noticed me because of this bracelet and they kind of, their shoulders kind of rose up or someone was inspired by me going out and being creative and it, it inspired them to be creative. And so there was this sort of emotional transaction that I didn't anticipate what happened. And so, you know, from that day forward, really that like first 48 hours of sort of making this bracelet and, and having that experience, I, I, I kind of knew it was my calling. Like, how do you, how do I scale positivity, you know, and how do I build a business behind that idea and essentially like just, you know, inspire people to, to see positivity to be inspired and do that through a brand. And so that's been the journey and that was sort of the inception of it. And so that was just kind of the spark, you know, 
from that point onwards, it was really, you know, just figuring out how to put the pieces together, you know? First I was hand making them, you know, taking the lighter and sort of like burning the tips and fusing them together and giving them to my friends. It wasn't done in a very professional way. I was so young at that time, I was about 17, and we didn't have social media in the sense that we have it today. There was no Alibaba. You can just go on and type type up a you know a factory and go and, and find out and make the product. So, you know, I decided to go to school and, and learn a little bit more about apparel. I went to Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise and studied business, apparel manufacturing. I designed for Levi, Reebok, Disney for about seven years. And then I eventually started that company, that that brand, that, that idea and that vision that I had when I was technically in, in high school. So it was an interesting journey at first. I didn't go straight into starting the business. You know, I kind of had the idea and then didn't really have the resources and the know-how. And so I went to school and learned that and then eventually took that idea to, to market. You and I were talking about I have this book coming out in a month and it's called Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and, and Doubters. And I always talk about people have asked me along the way, they're like, you're obviously like fearless. That's not me. Like, how do you ultimately go do it? I had worked in, you know, big companies actually that had sort of started small and then became bigger. I, you know, what was the moment when you finally said, I'm just going to go do this? Man, I remember (laughs) I was, uh, I was designing, I was was a technical designer for Levi's, wasn't making very much money, you know, a year. I was kind of making like 40, $50,000 a year. I was really great at it. I loved doing it, but I knew in my heart of hearts, if I was doing it by the time I was 35, I wouldn't feel fulfilled, like something would be missing. And I always knew that, you know, being from another country, I kind of came here and I kind of knew how to purpose. I had to make something of myself. And so I already, I always had that chip on my shoulder. And the point that I knew that I wanted to do, um, I kind of always knew it was just the right timing. And um, I got to a point in my career where I was like, you know, I wasn't as satisfied with it. You know, I knew that I wanted to go and do something bigger. And, you know, I had saved up, you know, small $4,000 and, you know, kind of everything kind of culminated my, my experience, just my drive, like the moment we were at and, and just like culture and everything that we were doing. And um, I just decided to start it. And so the first year I was working my job 40 hours a week and I was, you know, doing Rasta on the side for 40 hours a week, developing product and, you know, finding the factories and doing all the preliminary like branding and, and product development. So I did that for about a year. And then, you know, I got my first set of, you know, bracelets. I think I ordered about four, 2000 bracelets or so and um, started selling them basically at music festivals. And, you know, I went to Venice Beach. I set up a table once. I've done that. I've done all the things out there before e-commerce was the, the avenue where you could just easily put something up there and someone would buy it. But those are sort of the dog days of, of just being scrappy and getting started. I'm not an overnight e-com success business. Today is a different story, but the, the beginnings was really being, you know, very scrappy and just kind of getting after it. You know, you obviously thought, okay, where would my customer be, right? Mm-hmm. Like I always, you know, people will come to me and say like, okay, well, like what are your first stores that you, you know, got your, your product over here, hint water is, you know, my pride. Like, where, where, how did you think about it? And I'm like, you know, you just think about where your customer is, mm-hmm. right? I mean, what you did, like music festivals, right. like, and I'm sure you heard a lot of no's. Like, you probably had people saying, you can't set up a place here. And, you know, and I'm sure you just went and set it up down the street or whatever. Like, and, and how many music festivals said, no, like, it's not going to be a, like, this is, yeah. you know, this got to work for us. And they'll say no. And then you go to a different one. And, and so that's what I tell people, like the difference between, you know, the great entrepreneurs and the ones that aren't so great yeah. are the ones that like, they've listened to the rules and they don't, I don't even know that you'd call yourself a rule breaker. You just like, you just sort of like, you know, interpreted it differently, right? Like people said, you can't, be in this festival, you didn't sit there and say, oh, I can't be in every festival. You ins- Right? Am I guessing? Me and my business partner have a you know, saying, you can't get into the front door, get into the side window or the back door. No matter, yeah. that's entrepreneurship. It's find a way. You know, and I don't want to be cheesy, but where there's a will, there's a way. You know, I remember one of the first festivals that I went to, I was having, I wanted them to, to make the bracelet, the official bracelet of that festival. And they were like, oh, you're kind of a small guy. Like, no, why don't you just go there and set up a table? And I did such a good job, like, getting in there and guerrilla marketing. You know, one of my initial marketing tactics was 
when you're at a festival, you're so inundated with like, you know, food and music and people that the only two places that you're going to pay attention is the parking structure. When you're parking your car, there's not a lot to look at. And then the, the urinals and the, the bathrooms, right? So I would plaster my totally. in those areas. And after the first day, I was selling so much product. They were like, hey, I know that yesterday we said no, but we want to now buy your merchandise and put it in our merchandise area. And we worked out a basically a licensing deal, you know, in the span of a couple, you know, hours. And, you know, that's kind of how it happens. You just got to believe in yourself, be scrappy. And, you know, the results will, you know, will start to speak for themselves. Well, I think that the fact that, like you said, you're in over 200 countries and regions around the country too. The fact that you worked, I had friends who used to work at Levi Strauss. And, you know, I think it's obviously an iconic brand, but it's also a brand that is global, right? Mm -hmm. And years ago, they had, I think, franchises, and then they bought the franchises back. But there's like a lot of rules, right, all over the place. So I think just that education of sort of, you know, even if you weren't actually dealing with all of those different regions, just sort of like working inside and learning and listening and ed- being educated about it just helps you to do what you're doing, right? Yeah, I think that was the best experience was just working and learning the, the synergies of every different department in a business. Because, you know, when you first start your business, I mean, you know, unless you're going in the route where you're, you're getting fundraising and you're able to build a robust team from the jump, you know, if you're, if you're founder and entrepreneur and you're taking your own money and putting it out there, you know, you gotta, you have to wear all the hats for the first couple of years. And yep. so having a firm understanding of just the basics of, you know, accounting and marketing and sales and all the different things. And even to this day, you know, digital marketing and how to develop websites and things of that nature is imperative, you know? And so as much as you could learn from other people, it's important to sort of get your, your, your knowledge base up to a, a level where you could function. And then once you get some momentum, you can start hiring the right people, the best people. And then you have to, then you have to learn to get out of the way because, you know, that's the, that's also the hardest part. Once you get to that point, it's like you have to sort of unlearn what you, you know, you sort of train yourself to, you know, be in charge of a lot of things and you have to train yourself not to be in charge of everything. It's yeah. A yeah. <laughs> well, and it's it's interesting. I mean, in, in our case, I, and we're a 15 year old brand. I mean, we've like, you know, I was like, uh, you know, not only producing the product, but also, you know, schlepping cases around and getting them on the shelf. And, you know, and we have over 200 people in the company now. So, you know, I don't do that every day. But when, you know, COVID hit for us as a not only founder, but also as a CEO, I saw like we were having massive out of stock issues. We were starting to hear like from customer service centers. And again, it's sort of a complicated situation for people who don't sort of deal with third parties. But, you Mm -hmm. know, when like a target is out of stock on my product and I can't control that, like there's a saying like you do, you know, what you can control, right? And you like sort of live with that. But then I'm also like, well, they better fix it, right? <laughs> and you know, pretty quickly, like, or else I'm in yeah. trouble, yeah, right? Yeah. And and well, so, you know, I think it came back to the fact that I'll never forget. It was that weekend of March 13th, and that's when I really like I saw I was coming back from New York. We had shut down our New York office before even New York had shut down, and came back to San Francisco where I live. And on the way home from the airport, I stopped at Target and Whole Foods, and out of stock, out of stock, you know, or very low s- supply and there's no yeah. back stock. And I mean, that's not a good feeling. Like you no. as a, like, I just say this to one, other entrepreneurs and they're like, you know, on the one hand, you're like, yay, it's out of stock. And then all you're like, there's nothing to make any revenue on. Right. Like, this is not a good deal, like at all. And yeah. so I was freaking on that weekend and, you know, woke pretty much everybody in my team up and I'm like, what are we going to do? And we ultimately ended up reaching out to all of the, you know, buyers and said, you know, Hey, like, obviously there's an issue here with our, you know, warehousing and getting trucks or whatever, but can we send in trucks? Like, can we solve the problem? Then it led into another piece of this, which was, you know, we were shutting down offices. We had a team of people saying like, are you sending me into stores in the middle of COVID? Like, do you want me to die? And so like, I put on my, my hint jacket and I said, I'm going back to be a salesperson. And I took on a route. And so I think to your earlier point, what I found is that you may not do that job every single day, but understanding what your team does every day and you know, if, especially when you need to 
solve a problem. Like I bet you could walk back in and actually sell this bracelet. Right. Oh, yeah. And like, <laughs> and, and you know, the story when I went into target and, you know, first week, that week of, you know, March 16th and I'm, you know, in there, the poor guy at target, like he missed his buddy Ben and he was like, where's Ben? And I'm like, oh, I, I work for Hint and I'm just helping him out. And he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I've been here for a long time. I wasn't yeah. wondering the question. And then finally he was like, really asking. I was like, okay, I got to get, I yeah. got to stop this. And I said, I'm the founder. And oh, he's like, yeah. wait, what? You're yeah. like out here and you're doing this. And I was like, yeah, like it's awesome. And so I signed a bottle for him. You know, yeah. it was a whole like thing. But again, being able to be scrappy, never forgetting that you know what your team does every single day and how yeah. hard it is and, you know, helping, in our case, helping them put stuff together. How did you feel like through COVID? Like, what was your, you know, story? Like, I mean, it's a crazy time, obviously, through festivals and obviously e-commerce. and Yeah, I mean, well, now on the current day, you know, our business is, you know, about, if you really look at it, 80% of it is e-commerce. You know, we have retail stores um, around the nation from like Azumi's to Tilly's. We were sold in NBA retail stores, um, Major League Baseball um, arenas. We are the official license for the Olympics in 2020. So you can imagine March 13th. I think it was a Friday, Friday the 13th. Yep. Was the day that like I remember it well. <laughs> and so for us, it was really, it was such a challenge because we have these, these parts of our business that, you know, like sports, NBA, all of a sudden. You know, no more games, right? You're not selling any merchandise. Major League Baseball, you're not selling any merchandise. The Olympics has been postponed to the next year. You're not selling any merchandise. Um, your retail stores no longer can sell product in their store floors. And some of these retailers aren't really, you know, prepared for e-commerce in the way that it came. So for us, almost, you know, half of our business kind of almost came to a halt in one day. And really, it came down to looking at our e-commerce and our international business, which is a lot of that is e-commerce as well and focusing there. And it was really tough. You know, we, we really just got together as a team, just like every other entrepreneur. We all just like, there was a state of just like, you don't know which way is up, down, left or right for that first week. But you get this team together and you kind of, you know, really prioritize. And yeah, we just decided to focus on the areas that we had control over, you know, because we knew that we couldn't control what the leagues do. We knew that the retailers were in their own, you know, storm, you know, and so we allocated resources in the areas that we can really scale. And then also thinking about like, how do we deliver our, our vision and our message to our, to our customers at that time? Because, you know, the sales weren't going to be the same as a company whole, but there was definitely areas that we could really deliver our message and grow our audience. So we decided to change our messaging. We went to, you know, Feeding America and we, we, we partnered with uh, Meals on Wheels and got that going. We found ways to drive energy. And it like, even though it was such a, such a difficult time, not only for our business, but even everyone that works at Ross Plot, we found ways to kind of get inspired and be a part of that solution. And it drove our business and it drove our energy and it kept us alive. And so, you know, today we're, we're doing, we're doing great, but you know, we had to get through that, that storm. It's kind of like That's how fine. you did, you know, getting through it. And I love that you got scrappy and went in there and started selling and that's what it means to be an entrepreneur is that no job is, you know, big and too big for you, you know, and when, when it all comes down to it, you're responsible, you know, and um, for everything. And, uh, you know, so heavy wears the crown. You get to enjoy it when it's, when it's great and you're getting on these lists and you're on the news. It's great. But, you know, when things kind of hit the fan, like you're also the person that's got to be there to, to shoulder it. And that's the responsibility, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. What, so when you talked about, I mean, you talked a little bit about your team, I'd, I'd be curious to hear about like, do you think social responsibility has changed since March? Like in terms of like the definition, not only for your team, but also for your customer. I don't know what the answer is on this, but I, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, I, I think it's gone through this time of, it's had its episodes, right? So right? before COVID, it was kind of like there was social responsible brands, right? Mm -hmm. And we were that. We were one of those brands. We would we give back to the community. You know, every four months, we'd get out of the office. We'd do something for the environment or whatever the case would be. We've always been socially conscious. We've always been purpose-driven. But when COVID hit, it was so funny. Every brand, all of a sudden overnight, because a lot of brands couldn't sell products, they became socially conscious, 
right? And it was great, you know, it really helped power just the goodwill of, of everything. And everyone felt like for the first time, we were all in the same, it didn't matter what race, color, creed, where you were at, we're all in the same like box of humanity and companies got behind that movement. And so I, I felt for like the first three or four months of COVID like that was, that was the initiative. And then now it's almost been, been re, redefined. I think some people, companies have just kind, of, just kind of gone back to, you know, business as usual. And then there's companies like ourselves where we've even committed further you know, this month we are launching our Seek the Positive Foundation where we're really like getting down and donating 1% of all net proceeds to this foundation, you know, for the time going forward with Rasta Cloud and figuring out ways to be responsible, not just when something happens, but for it to be a part of who we are and uh, put our money where our mouth is. And so I've seen other brands take further leaps and commitments towards social responsibility. And it doesn't mean you know, support everything. It's just support the things that are authentic to, to your brand and yourself as a founder and your team. It's evolving. And I think it's just an interesting time. I think it did breed a new level of a, a social awareness, COVID. I think that's the positive that came out of it. And I think there was also, you know, I, you know, brands that just kind of came out and did what they had to do and kind of went back to the reg- regular schedule program. And, you know, so there's, there's a little bit of that too. Yeah. Well, and I think those brands, you know, I feel the same way. I think those brands that did that, those are the same people that ask me, like, how how do you make a brand that's authentic? Right. And it's like, you know, and you see, it's just, it's like you practice what you preach. Right. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's the thing. I mean, even look, it's easy for us because we're a water company to do this, but you know, we've been showing up for years with first responders. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. with all the fires going on in California right now, I mean, you know, I'm living it. I, I live nine miles from a fire that's been like sitting there. It's, it's, it's sort of, you know, simmering out at this point, but on mm-hmm. the coast in Marin County, you know, just over the Golden Gate Bridge, it's like, it's, I had smoke. I'm, I'm still, it's getting better today, actually, but it's been wet air quality or 250. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it's been really, really bad. And so, you know, I, it's like crazy how I'm like, talking to not only the local fire departments, you know, that were fighting these fires initially, but the forestry service, which Mm -hmm. was like the federal, you know, people. And anyway, and obviously, you know, we have water to give. And so we sent in a bunch of truckloads and stuff. And, but the fact that like when we talk to customers about that, like, you know, I'm like, oh, by the way, like, this is what we're doing. Like, I'll talk about it on social. And I'm like, hey, this is John. John's yeah. my new buddy. He had never had hint before, but now he likes hint a lot because yeah, he was yeah. thirsty and he was yeah. like, and like, let's hear it for John. Yeah. And like, people are like, you know, that's awesome. Like, I didn't even know you guys were doing that, you know? Yeah. And like, where's everybody else, you know? And, and mm-hmm. I don't focus on like what everybody else is doing. Like, yeah. I hope they, they leave. I hope they come with me. I hope they call me and say like, Hey, can we help too? Like yeah. I, you know, and I'm sure it sounds like you do the same thing. Tell me about. So the Seek the Positive Foundation, really, we, we wanted to focus on like one of the problems that we see in the world is, you know, you know, uh, personal development. When we think about personal development is, you know, education. You know, I think we'll, when I grew up, it was, you know, go to school, you know, go to college, get a, you know, become a lawyer, a doctor, whatever the case may be. And we just live in a different um world now, you know, where, you know, you can become an influencer and have a business and have a clothing line, or you could be, you could be a video gamer and be able to, you know, take that and and be just more successful than a doctor, you know? So I think that's one thing is like, we want to tackle being able to give kids the opportunity to chase these other sort of alternative, you know, type of types of career. And so it's not only the career development side of it, it's also the emotional intelligence and different things of that nature, teaching people what they don't teach us at school. You know, if I remember, if I think about all the education that I've gotten in the traditional form, you know, I learned a lot of the book stuff, but, you know, it takes mentors, great, you know, parents, grandparents, bosses, like to really teach you like about life, you know? And so, you know, the foundation's focused on that, the personal development piece, which covers, you know, that, and then also equality, really making sure that everyone has an opportunity to get a equal opportunity in this world. I mean, I understand that we're not all cut from the same cloth and we won't, but if we as an organization can help young girls, you know, find opportunities to do things that that men are able to do, people of different races and disabilities and so on and so forth have those same opportunities, 
then that's a win for us. So that's just something that we're really passionate about is, you know, the personal development and quality side of things and um, carrying that forward with, with the foundation. And so what we'll be doing is we definitely partner with other nonprofits that fit in with those, within those constructs. And we do campaigns with them. We'll develop product. You know, percentage of the proceeds will go to them from the product and things of that nature. We'll go out and get our hands dirty and do service work. We'll give donations and scholarships and things of that nature. And so we're just getting started. But um, yeah, it's, it's just it's just something that we feel is just so important. And it, it just it helps us also own our give back. It's one thing to be able to partner with a lot of different organizations, but to own your give back, you're able to do it more authentically and more consistently than you would otherwise. And so, yeah, so we're just getting started. Uh, September 22nd will be the date. And um, I love it. Definitely check it out. So what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Man, my 20-year-old self, you know, I think the advice that I would give myself at 20, knowing what I know now, would have probably been to get started earlier, right? Hmm. As much as I got a lot of great experience from working and doing all the things, I think I probably could have found a way, even in that landscape, you know, should I have gotten started. I'm glad I did what I did. I have no regrets with that, but I probably would have pushed myself more to like go, like lift up every rock and figure out, you know, how I can get this brand going. So if I started when I'm 20, I would be 30 now. I'm 37 now, but I'd be 30 and you would already have the foundation and, and doing a lot of positive things in the world. And so, just get going, get going a lot faster and a lot earlier. You have so much time though. You're <laughs> don't, don't, patient with yourself. You're, <laughs> you're like, yeah, no. That's my entrepreneurial brain. It's like, how do we get going? How do we get it done faster? How do we get it done better? More impact, you know? So. Well, I think that, you know, that that's important, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, you have excitement, you want to go do stuff. But I also think that, you know, as I always share with people, I mean, I've even, you know, shared with people that I mentor that have started companies. I'm like, go, you know, go learn for a little while. Yeah. Like go, there's no right way. Like people think, you know, maybe just by listening to you or me where it's like, you go start in big companies and then you can go start a company, but you know, go start a little company and then like take a break and then go and do, I mean, I remember this probably isn't the best example, but, um, the one of the founders of, of Soul Cycle, you know, I mm. remember when she they sold Soul Cycle, she ended up going inside WeWork and going and doing, you know, a marketing role, like you know, just because she just like wanted to learn, right? And people were like, "Wait, what? What? Yeah. What is she doing?" But I was like, I have mad respect for the mm-hmm. fact that she's doing what other people like don't expect her to do. Like people always like when you found a company, they want you to go found another company. Yeah. And it's like, wait, I just finished. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you know, and I think there's nothing wrong with like going inside to maybe, you know, hone yeah. skills in certain areas or whatever. So yeah. anyway. My question, my answer is, is based on what I know now, right? Yeah. What I've done it at 20. And so I think I, like you, like you said, you do need to learn. You've got to like kind of get the skill set. You've got to see how things work. And then your, your, your probability of success are much higher, you know, but yeah, knowing what I know now, what I got started earlier. And I think, um, but yeah, I absolutely think that people should go out and, and, you know, get, I think mentorship is really important too. It's like, if you could find other entrepreneurs out there that you're, and you're willing to like really learn from them and give them some sort of value and learn from someone that's done it and been there you're going to get the most fast track education that you've ever gotten. And so nowadays, you know, even at my age now, I invest in being part of, you know, different groups of entrepreneurs and learning not only about entrepreneurship, but how to run, you know, a successful life. You're not just a business. Yeah. So Which, that. what, what groups, how have you found those, you know, other entrepreneurs or mentors? Yeah, one of the earliest ones, I was invited to um, Necker Island, which is Richard Branson's Island, a few years ago, actually four or five years ago. And I met a really great group of entrepreneurs there and obviously Richard Branson. So it's like, you know, there's there's a group of there that are international entrepreneurs that are doing very purpose-led driven things and they're grand things, you know, trying to solve like big, big problems. Um, and then, you know, even on a micro level, kind of getting into a young president's organization, which is here in Southern California, they have chapters all around the world where, you know, as long as your business hits a certain sort of qualification, you get access to 
classes. It's basically like you're signing up for, you know, continued education, you know, and it's in all forms, whether it's from business to your personal life to, you know, wellness to whatever the case may be. So I I'm make sure of that, YPO in the Bay Area too. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a really, really great program. And um and EO is also a great group too. Like if you're just, you know, starting a company and you don't hit certain levels. I know people that have been in EO and I've spoken at EO a lot. Like there's great people that, you know, find people in there too. But man, I would have found those groups earlier, you know, when I was, you know, maybe my first or second year, because I would have qualified my first or second year in business. But I, I kind of had five years of not having that mentorship. I think this is another thing is like if you're able to get that mentorship earlier, you know, if your business hits a million dollar revenue mark, you can apply for some of these groups and start talking to people that are doing 20, 30, 40 million in revenue and learn from those guys. Over a year, you've gained so much knowledge that you maybe you wouldn't have gained, you know, hanging out with maybe your friends for five years and trying to like ask them about questions or your family members or people that don't understand what you're going through. So that's another way I think that can kind of get you on the fast track of learning and executing. Yeah, I've also found too that, you know, especially the the people that like make a list of the people that you like, you know, really think are, are doing it right. Like, and are doing, you know, you think Daniel's like, you know, the coolest thing he pretty much is, but I mean, it's like, you know, you find these people like that and, you know, not stalk them, but I think like on social, I mean, I've had a lot of people, you know, I'm pretty active in social, but in particular on Twitter, like that's kind of where a lot of my audience is. And I've had people reach out and say like, you know, hey, I'm like, I've got this question for you. And, you know, you'd be amazed. I mean, there's a lot of time where people won't respond. But I think that, you know, if somebody asked you a quick question that wasn't going to take you very long, like I bet you would answer it, right? Like it's like, you, you know, yeah, it's, it's so much easier in so many ways to get access to like people if you have an interesting question and they feel like, oh, wow, I could really learn from this person and they're curious. And like, I think social is like underrated. Like you don't even necessarily have to join a group to find the answers to your questions or yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I get those DMs all the time and it's, you know, people that write thoughtful questions and you can really see that they have a, a passion to do something and they just want one question asked, answered. You know, it's like, it's the least that you could do for some, I mean, you, you know, the heartache of operating a business and the things that you have to learn by making mistakes. I mean, if you could save someone just that piece of heartache, it it just like it's something that I I can't get myself to not answer the DM. So I, I always answer that. Yeah. No, I love I love it. And I do I do believe it's like and you never know where you're gonna be able to meet these people too. I mean my my story, Jamie Diamond from JP Morgan, I as my husband said, he you're probably the only one in America who didn't know who Jamie Diamond was. He happened to be sitting next to me at a dinner. Oh my god! And, and you know, so we're just everybody wanted to talk to him about Bitcoin, and you know what? He didn't want to talk about Bitcoin. He wanted to like hear about you know Scrappy Kara and her water company, and like and was asking me all the things that you know. And he loves hot sauce, and he wanted to talk to me about doing a hot sauce brand. You know, like not the not the conversation, but of course, like I was willing to just be real and like talk to him. And now he's you know he's become like not an official mentor, but he's somebody that when I've been financing my company and I've got questions and I'm kind of like, you know, I don't do it often, but once a year I can like mm -hmm. reach out and say, should I do this? Should I not? Am I thinking about this right? He is like, boom, yeah. you know? And so again, like, I think you never know where these people are going to come from. And sometimes it's like just showing up and finding these people and, you know, along the way. So, yeah. No, absolutely. Well, this, this is an awesome, awesome, awesome time with you. You guys, um, thank you so much. I, I don't even need to ask you the question, what makes you unstoppable? Because I mean, you have you have told us and all of your experiences is so great. Everybody find Daniel on uh what's the best way to um, I mean, you can find me on Instagram. It's just daniel.cassidi, K-A-S-I-D-I. Um, if you guys have any questions, like I said, DM me. I'm always willing to help. And, you know, I think um, for me, it's, it's just about being relentless with whatever vision that you have and just never letting letting up, you know. It's, I love uh, it. Rastaclot.com. Rastaclot.com. That's the website. You guys can go there and um, and get the bracelets. We have these new bracelets coming out. They say Seek the Positive on there. Just reminds you to keep that positive mindset every single day. 
like I said, 1% of all of our uh, net proceeds get donated to a foundation we will be doing good. So if you guys make a purchase here, you're also making a, uh, a vote for good. I love it. I love it so much. And if you guys like this podcast, give it a great review and uh, definitely subscribe and super, super awesome. So thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. Unstoppable.